Hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Culture Heritage, IMPACT, and the IMPACT Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Professor Sharda Srinivasan, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Sharda Srinivasan is a professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, NIAS Bangalore. She received the Padma Shri, the fourth highest civilian award from Government of India last year in archaeology. She has made pioneering contributions to the study of archaeology and history of art from the perspective of exploring engineering applications in these disciplines, that is archaeometry, archaeometallurgy, and archaeological sciences. She has a PhD from Institute of Archaeology, University of University College London in 1996 on archaeometallurgy of South Indian bronzes. Her master's from School of Oriental and African Studies, London in 1989, and BTEC in Engineering Physics from IIT Mumbai completed in 1987. She is a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and World Academy of Art and Science. She is a recipient of the Dr. Kalpana Chawla Young Women Scientists Award for 2011, the Indian Institute of Metals. Certificate of Excellence 2007 and Materials Research Society of India Medal 2006, the Malki B. Nagar Ethno Archaeology Award in 2005, and the DST SCRC Young Scientist Fellowship, the Flinders Petrie Medal in 1989 from the University of London, the Materials Research Society Graduate Student Award 1996. She's also a recipient of the DST Nurture Scheme and Young Scientist Awards. She was co-recipient with Exeter University of a British Council funded UKEIRI Research Award from 2009 to 11 and a Royal Society DST Award related to developing joint PhD programs in intangible histories, including archaeology and performance studies. She has been a Forbes Research Associate at the Department of Scientific Research and Conservation Freer Gallery of Arts, Smithsonian Institution, USA in 1999, and Homi Baba Fellow at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore from 1996 to 1998. Her landmark contributions have included archaeometric characterization of bronze of South India using lead isotope analysis, archaeometallurgical studies on ancient mining and metallurgy in Southern India, studies on roots of steel, and documenting artisanal technologies such as mirror making and bronze casting at Swami, Malay, and so on. Having worked on artifacts in the British Museum, Victoria and Albert Museum, London, Government Museum, Chennai, and so on. She is the first author of the book, India's Legendary Roost Steel, an Advanced Material of the Ancient World, and author of more than 60 research papers. Above all this, she's also an acclaimed performer of Bharatanatyam and has given numerous lecture demonstrations. The title of today's talk is Highlights of Indian Metallurgical Heritage. This lecture will highlight the metallurgical heritage from Indian antiquity with respect to ferrous and non-ferrous metallurgy and trends in the use of metals, alloys, and metal extraction. In particular, some of the pioneering contributions of the Indian subcontinent would be touched upon, including insights in terms of mining and metallurgy and metal extraction, and studies on archaeometallurgical debris. Aspects touched upon the evidence for hard rock and alluvial extraction of gold in the Hatti Muski region and elsewhere in South India, the making of high grade woods, Uku, crucible steel from southern India exported to make the famous Damascus blades, the earliest known remains of zinc smelting in the world as found in Zawar region of Rajasthan, which was one of the more difficult to extract as metal and the high zinc alloy of Bidri ware and so on. So before I invite Professor Srinivasan for this exciting talk, may I request all of you to please put your microphones on mute. We'll be taking the questions right after the talk. So please use the chat facility to type in your questions and also type in your name, email ID, and contact details in that. Thank you, Professor Srinivasan, for agreeing for this talk. Over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Padma. It's a great pleasure to be on this program and uh, have this opportunity to share with all of you in this very interesting series of uh, intact conservation insights. 
Um, and uh, I should say that I was, um, with this kind of topic, one is never sure whether, at, at what level to pitch it, you know, because it could be a wide audience. So um, I, I forgive me if it comes across as <laughs> something that many of you would already be familiar with, because one often doesn't know, uh, you know, whether one is talking to, you know, kind of audience and the range of their backgrounds. So anyway, um, so I'm going to try this screen share now. Is that all right? Yeah. So it's all right, the screen share? Yeah, it's coming. I'll let okay, you fine. know. It's, it's yeah. On. yeah, okay. Good. Right. Perfect. Okay. So, um, so I'll be uh, sharing a few insights from uh, in, with respect to Indian metallurgical traditions. Of course, that in itself is a very vast topic. Um, and I realized you can't really cover everything. So perhaps the emphasis would be on a focus on case studies from Southern India, which is uh, where I've done a lot of my work. But I guess uh, the uh, main objective is also to try and uh, understand some of the uh, overall facets in terms of you know, studying and characterizing uh, metals and materials, which is, of course, an important underlying aspect in terms of uh, the conservation, uh, conservation science and preservation of uh, metal artifacts and you know, the study of artifacts and art objects in general. Now, uh, so now, what is happening here? Yeah. So um, I guess the broader aims in terms of uh, pedagogic approaches in the study of history of science and technology and metallurgy and the implications for conservation science are to understand the history of metallurgy in terms of understanding the march of uh, civilization and to trace the trajectory of the major use of metals and alloys in antiquity and to gain an insight into the study of metallurgical heritage and the related discipline of archaeometallurgy and archaeomaterials research. And then to probe a bit more the relevance of material science in terms of uh, gaining more insights towards conservation and preservation of artifacts and so on. Uh, which I suppose many of you are already familiar with many of these introductory aims, so I don't need to dwell on it too much. And uh, I suppose it would be fair to say that early society's fascination for metals stemmed out of the demand for production of a range of utilitarian artifacts, such as weapons and tools, and also quite early on, of course, the use of decorative, ritual, and symbolic artifacts. And the usage of metal uh, goes back to early prehistory uh, with the trajectory of the extraction and production of metals and alloys, which has in fact, contributed greatly to laying the foundations of science and technology as we see today. And of course, it's interesting that uh, while modern metallurgy has seen an exponential growth since the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. several of the important innovations and inventions also have their seeds going back to the range of ancient or traditional practices. So it's important to bridge some of these um, facets. Now, metals were extracted and utilized in the past progressively from the use of native metal or metal in the elemental state to those metals which could be smelted more easily from ores, and then later on those which were more difficult to smelt and extract and so on. And as such, I suppose, uh, as I was saying, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, the range of metals and materials that we are familiar with has grown exponentially, but in antiquity, there were I suppose about eight to 10 uh, major metals which were in widely in vogue, metals and alloys which were in vogue, including of course, gold, silver, copper, iron, tin, lead, zinc, and mercury. And as in the rest of the world, uh, the Indian subcontinent has also made major contributions in several of these areas. Well, I realize that there are these time constraints, I really can't cover everything, so I will uh, pick out a few um, areas in which uh, there are some uh, particular interesting aspects of, you know, original work or so on that one could uh, 
you know, used to throw light on some of these aspects. Well, gold and silver, of course, are found in the native state and they were used in early antiquity to make jewelry and hammered into sheet metal due to the great ductility and luster of pure metals. And gold is recovered um, in two ways. One is that nuggets of gold are known to have been retrieved from riverbeds, which is the alluvial or placer mine of gold. And um, of course, iron is the one element which doesn't occur in the planet Earth in the native state, but it does um, occur as meteoritic iron. And quite early on also, you do have the exploitation of meteoritic iron, as for example, uh, a dagger from Egypt has been reported to be of meteoritic of iron. And of course, as we know already in early Egypt, uh, you have very spectacular examples such as the mask of the Pharaoh Tutankhamun, which uses a range of materials, including bitumen and so on. And this is um, uh, a lot of the work here, of course, was woodwork, which is then gilded with uh, gesso and resin and so on. And this was in the exhibition that was on last year at the Sachi Gallery uh, from the Egyptian Museum on uh, Tutankhamun. Uh, he's going to the netherworld. And somehow I think it's we all archeologists, something of us always, uh, at least I certainly have this fascination with Egypt, which <laughs> is, is something deep within the, uh, you know, this quest for eternity, so to speak. Um, and it's also interesting, of course, that, you know, of course, I think also uh, Professor Raman spoke about the various ages in archaeology and so on, so on, we touch upon all that. But, I mean, while we do look at these different ages, such as Copper, Copper Age or Bronze Age and Iron Age, uh, and, and there is a certain a linear progression, you know, from the use of native metals to those which are slightly easier to extract and those which are more difficult to extract. It's quite interesting that in some parts of the world, for instance, the South Americans almost don't seem to have really emerged out of what could be called the gold age in a way, because that was what they used the most, the noble metals such as uh, gold and silver and even platinum. Uh, which they found in native state by extensive shaping and hammering, but they never moved over to the use of iron. They never actually used bellows and smelting and so on. And this is a model of the Muisca raft in Colombia, which uh, is also associated with El Dorado and so on. Um, and of course, uh, in India as well, you have very quite early evidence from the Indian subcontinent for the use of gold, such as from the Harappan sites as Mohenjo-daro, Mandi, and Dhalavira, and so on. And uh, so there are numerous sheet-hammered artifacts, including the gold headbands made by repousse and gold beads and so on. And typically, uh, these kind of headbands were also used, as you can see, from the priest king at Mohenjo-daro. Uh, there, uh, you can just imagine what the, that would have probably been a gold headband that was being sported with uh, some kind of jewelry or other ornamental motif. And uh, coming to the mining uh, of gold, as I was mentioning, there are two ways in which gold is extracted. One is uh, as alluvial gold from the top of the hilltops where the uh, load is seen to progress. And uh, in this case, it is auriferous quartz, which is uh, uh, the quartz which has certain reefs of gold and things like that running through it. And uh, in Karnataka, there are many old gold workings in the region of the Hatti Muski region, where hard rock mining for gold was done following these veins of auriferous quartz. And of course, there's also a well-known rock edict of Ashoka in the Muski region. And this region was also referred to as Suvarnagiri or mountain of gold, which might refer to the uh, attempts to and obtain gold from these mines. And there are also uh, numerous ash mounds with mulaka fragments for the crushing of gold and so on. I didn't have time to put in a lot more slides from here, but anyway. And the other way in which gold is extracted is through the um, alluvial uh, alplasa mining, where the nuggets of gold are washed down from the top of the hills in these uh, streams. And so they collect at the bottom of the riverbeds and they are uh, then, the, the gold is then collected by uh, using these fans of wood in which the 
heavier gold particles tend to settle down and the uh, lighter particles supports and so on tends to get washed out. And so this was actually uh, some Kurumba children in the region of the Nilgiris where also there are these uh, uh, very large old world gold workings in the Gurlur area. And you can see here how it's actually following the uh, auriferous quartz veins. And uh, here, of course, the Kurumba children are quite, uh, they were quite capable. I was there in, in the 90s and they were also using uh, the technique of mercury amalgam to extract a bit of this gold where because they're very, very fine particles of gold and now the working of gold has become in a way uneconomical. They were using uh, mercury to amalgamate with the gold and then when it formed this little amalgam, they would then burn it off. They would burn the mercury off so that the gold would uh, then be retrieved. And of course, they actually don't make much of a living with this. They really earn a pittance. But anyway, it's something which, uh, uh, you know, keeps them going in terms of livelihood and so on, although it's now quite illegal to mine in these uh, areas, nevertheless. And it's quite interesting that uh, in the region of the Nilgiris, you do have rather spectacular finds of early gold, such as from the Nilgiri Cairns, which are dated to about the mid uh, first millennium BCE. And uh, many of these were in the Briggs collection in the British Museum. And here you already see, of course, the use of the technique of granulation to make floral motifs and so on. And so the technique of granulation is one where uh, these gold microsphere, microspheres or granules, uh, because you know gold also has this property that it tends to, uh, because of the surface tension, it tends to form these little granules. So there's this technique of granulation which you find uh, quite well developed in the Hellenistic world and so on. And that's also seen here in the Nilgiri material. But I suppose we needn't necessarily look for antecedents in the Hellenistic world and so on. It's possible that there are those, but you already see the use of microbeads, for example, from uh, uh, Harappan sites uh, quite early on, such as Lothal and so on. So this technique of making very tiny spherules of gold, uh, you know, using surface tension techniques and all that was already in vogue and it could well also uh, perhaps be correlated to a long-standing tradition, but certainly under the, in the Hellenistic period, this granulation technique became much more widely uh, used in the world. And uh, it's also interesting that in the Nilgiris, uh, you still have some of these communities who uh, live with very distinctive uh, traditional ways of dressing and they have their own distinctive languages and so on. And, uh, one of these are the Kotas who also wear this very distinctive kind of gold jewelry and ornamental motifs. And uh, you know, the, the hair is also coiled in a bun to one side, which is known as a kokot. And it also reminds you to some extent of the Mohenjo-daro dancing girl with the bun to the side. And uh, it's the kind of pin that they use it to, to, to adhere it. And this also, you also see this kind of hairstyle amongst the bones and so on. And the quotas in the past were also known to have been gold and silversmiths. So again, you know, uh, I guess there's a lot to be understood in terms of uh, the living communities and the past legacies and traditions and so on, and certainly more scope for archaeology there. Professor well, Srinivasan, sorry yes. to interrupt, but the volume, uh, many of them are finding the volume a little low, so they, they will just increase a little bit, maybe a where do I increase it? Is it in the... Uh, if you could just speak maybe a little louder. Or in, okay, speak louder. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So you just want me to speak louder, nothing else? Yeah, right? a little no. bit. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. or does it... Do I need to increase the volume? No, no, the, the system is fine. It's just yeah, yeah. that uh, if you can just... Speak a bit louder. Okay, yeah, I need right. To speak. Thank you. Yeah. So is this better? Maybe if I hold this... Uh, yeah. Much, much better. Okay, yeah. Thank so you. anyway, thank you for pointing out because... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So now, uh, well, copper is also one of the metals which is found in the native state. And uh, 
The early usage of copper would have also been in the native state uh, in the unalloyed or natural form. And native copper is also abundantly available in uh, the Great Lakes area of North America, for example. And it was used uh, to make weapons and implements solely by hammering, hammering and annealing and so on. So they did not also move on towards casting and smelting and such like. And copper, of course, also occurs as oxides and ores. You have the cuprite, which is oxides, and malachites, which are carbonates, and uh, chalcopyrite, which is a sulfide ore. And of course, the mineral region of Rajasthan and K3 had extensive copper mines which were exploited in antiquity. And there was also uh, a tradition of copper smelting going on there till right into the 19th century, as uh, some illustrations and descriptions uh, indicate. And in southern India, you do have some important uh, old workings and open cast excavations in uh, Karnataka, for example, and you can hear, see here the green uh, malachite ore remains. Um, well, I, when I, while, while I was on the Hatli Maski uh, belt, I should mention that there have been some carbon dates of the uh, uh, old gold workings in the Hatli region, which came, which Radha Krishnan uh, and Curtis reported, which came to about the fourth century BCE, which are some of the very early dates for hard rock mining that you find anywhere in the world, because quite often in many parts of the world, it was the alluvial gold which was being extracted. Um, and uh, just to take you to, through the process of what uh, archaeometallurgy also involves, which is the study of uh, uh, the debris from smelting and metal extraction and so on. Um, so these are some slag heaps near the region of Basavanahalli near the Ingildhal oil copper workings that, which I was pointing to. And typically you find a lot of, uh, you know, archaeometallurgical debris in the form of slag. So slag is basically the waste from the smelting cycle, whereby, so the ore typically consists of the metal and, you know, some of the uh, waste rocks, such as the siliceous quartz and uh, the gang and other impurities. So when you smelt and reduce the ore from the oxide state to the um, metal state, then the impurities tend to float to the top of the, uh, to the furnace. And that tends to form a kind of cake, which is referred to as the slag. And typically then the metal floats to the bottom of the furnace where it can be tapped out and such like. So it's these cakes of the impurities and the metallurgical debris, which is uh, quite rich in silica and so on, which is also quite interesting and significant because that also contains the trapped remnants of the metal which is being smelted. So that when we study that, we get a better idea of the actual pyrotechnological processes that were in use and so on. So uh, typically you would see these uh, lumps of slag and such like lying amidst uh, what you're also seeing as other cones which were used for the ore crushing, which is typically like your grinding stones and pestles and so on. And you, you would also probably find pieces of charge, the uh, concentrated ore which has been uh, made into pellets and things like that by crushing. And here you also find some evidence for pottery early historic Shatavana pottery and so on. And there is in fact a carbon date from the Ingledal mine of the Shatavana period. And typically with the slag which has been tapped from the bottom of the furnace, you see a certain flow texture, which is why it is generally referred to as tap slag. And so, well, when we use the tools of uh, microscopic examination and so on of to study the slags as well as artifacts, that gives us a lot of useful information, which can help us to reconstruct the processes to some extent. And for example, uh, you're looking here above at the microstructure of the copper slag from Ingeldal, which shows a typical, um, what we call a prill. A prill is basically a solidified droplet of the waste metal. And the rest of the slag tends to consist of uh, siliceous materials, such as it's a glassy kind of matrix. It consists of paleite and other uh, kinds of materials, which also contain some of the iron. Because for instance, in this case, it's quite interesting because what 
that uh, it tells you the sulfide ring tells you that if this is not actually the uh, smelting of copper oxidos, but it's already the smelting of copper sulfidos, because you see this ring of sulfide which is formed around the uh, the, the copper prill, and so in this case. Uh, it's a chalcopyrite ore, and that tends to also have a lot of iron impurities. And so the iron gets into the, the glassy matrix, you know, to form phthalite and so on. And so what you're seeing in the center there is the prill of copper metal. And in this case, apart from microscopy, of course, I think by now you would all be familiar with techniques um, of an analyzing materials such as scanning electron microscopy and, <coughs> sorry, electron probe microanalysis and such like. And uh, so here what you're looking at is uh, some further analysis done using electron probe microanalysis, wavelength dispersive spectroscopy. And here you see that, uh, you know, there are other interesting things that you can do with uh, the use of EPME analysis, uh, which is uh, described as the elemental distribution map. You can do a combined elemental distribution map for different sets of elements. So that gives you an idea of the ways in which the elements segregate through the slag and so on. So in this case, you can see it's quite dramatic because you see that the copper is concentrating, of course, in that metal, in that metal prill, which looks very light colored, as you can see. And the pink uh, uh, sort of ring around it corresponds to the sulfur rich region. So it is really separated from the, uh, the sulfide uh, and it has got reduced in that sense. And then all around it, you see these iron rich lathes, which is the phthalite slag. And that is also uh, quite interesting because sometimes the traces of elements which separate into the copper are also useful to us, as I'll be talking a bit tomorrow, uh, when it comes to maybe attempting correlations between artifacts and ores and such like. So now I'll move on to, um, I think I'd probably have time mainly to discuss uh, the ferrous metals and then a little bit on zinc and then move on to, uh, I thought you might be interested to see that uh, the video on the, the bell casting, which I might not have time later to show. And of course, iron, as I mentioned, it occurs in the native state and that was also, um, well, in the native state as meteoritic iron which was also exploited, for example, by the North American Indians to make weapons. And uh, one reason why iron, of course, comes into vogue a bit later than some of the other uh, metals such as copper and bronze and so on, uh, or the use of tin and lead and such like, is that iron, of course, has a high melting point of around 1550 uh, uh, degrees centigrade. And hence, uh, it was not e that easy to reduce. And in fact, most of the uh, processes of smelting in antiquity for, for iron was a solid state process, which produced the bloomery iron. And then this, of course, came into vogue in numerous places in the old world, uh, uh, by the, uh, certainly in India, by the mid uh, second millennium BC, or at least the, the later part of the second millennium BC. Uh, in several places, but as Padma said, and I also uh, pointed out, uh, this is not exactly so much a, an archaeological talk as mainly to look at metals and materials and so on. But anyway, there is quite a rich body of, uh, you know, accounts of various uh, travelers going back to the Mediterranean accounts and so on, uh, which point to the importance of Indian iron and the fact that it was uh, quite coveted and such like. For example, uh, there are accounts that Quintius Curtius, uh, he wrote that during the campaign of Alexander in the Indus region, he said to have been presented with a hundred talents of bright iron or ferrum candidum as it was called. Um, and anyway, this is just a little uh, illustration from a book, India's Legendary Wood Steel, um, capturing the essence of uh, this uh, rather intriguing exchange. And uh, well, coming to the Delhi Iron Pillar, of course, that uh, already points to the fact it stands as testimony to the prowess of Indian iron and steel and uh, indicates that the forging of wrought iron seems to have reached its zenith in India in the first millennium CE. And it is the earliest large forging 
uh, anywhere in the world. And it is dated by inscription to the Gupta period of the fourth century CE and stands at a height of about seven meters and weight of about six tons and so on. And of course, it's uh, been described as a rustless wonder and uh, you know, by metallurgist Anantaraman and has generated a lot of interest around the world. And of course, it's not totally rustless though. For instance, you see this spot here, which is, uh, it was, it was hit by a cannon. You can see that, uh, you know, along the edges and things. Perhaps that's the edge of the weld because it is believed that the pillar is, is made by forging together a series of disc-shaped iron blooms. And so it could be along the line, the fault line of the weld that uh, it's developing its cracks. And it is, uh, you can see that it is rusting there. But generally it's, resisted corrosion uh, very well and, uh, you know, for some 1500 years or so. And uh, the study of the iron pillar is also forms an important part of the background of this discipline of archimetallurgy, so to speak, in terms of the historiography of the uh, scientists and so on who were interested in studying metallurgical artifacts. And in fact, probably one of the first um, metal artifacts to have been studied from anywhere in the world was the Delhi Iron Pillar. And uh, this was a study made by Sir Robert Hatfield in 1912. And he was, uh, of course, celebrated metallurgist who developed manganese steels or the Hatfield steel, which had about 13% of manganese and had a high impact strength. And he also, of course, studied the Delhi Iron Pillar so that it was one of the first archaeological samples to have been studied. And many others, such as Vincent Ball in 1881, also admired this pillar and commented that, uh, uh, you know, producing such a pillar would have been uh, an impossibility in many of the foundries around the world and so on. <coughs> and it's interesting that uh, I was also able to contribute along with other scholars to the designation of the Iron Pillar as an ASM historical landmark. Uh, the ASM, of course, is a very renowned uh, uh, metallurgical standard, uh, which also lists numerous, art numerous uh, landmarks, for instance, the Eiffel Tower, the Iron Bridge Gorge, and so on. So it's a matter of pride for us, of course, that the Delhi Iron Pillar has also been uh, designated and uh, the, uh, so we were also involved in the nomination, uh, some of the uh, colleagues at NIAS, like uh, Dr. Vali Raj and Professor Ranganathan and so on. And the plaque says, of course, a rustless metallurgical marvel dedicated to ancient iron making traditions and blacksmiths. And uh, of course, apart from the dimensions, uh, one of the remarkable aspects of the iron pillar is the absence of corrosion, which has been linked to the composition and the high purity of the wrought iron the phosphorus content and the distribution of slag and such like. And uh, so there have been attempts to analyze the iron pillar apart from Hatfield, the NML laboratory also. And so they reported that it had about 0.2 to 0.3% carbon and uh, silica of about, uh, silicon of about 0.05% uh, and phosphorus of about 0.15% so percent, which is generally what is reported to be the phosphorus level of uh, from the various analyses. And I was also involved in a study with uh, late Bala Subramaniam, who's now no more, and uh, his paper was published also in the Buma Proceedings, which I was one of the co-editors. And you can see here the scanning electron microstructure of the section of the Delhi Iron Pillar which shows that it has this entrapped slag particles, which is surrounded by perlite networks. And so this slag is also uh, considered to be a factor in terms of enhancing the corrosion resistance because it's been hammered and forged so well that the slag has been quite uniformly distributed. And that also uh, tends to contribute to the uh, corrosion resistance and so on. And, uh, of course, the relative humidity of the Delhi and, uh, of, of Delhi is also very low, which has also helped. You see that the, uh, the the top part of the pillar is is in pretty good shape compared to the bottom part of it. And anyway, uh, of course, many of us 
can't help but remember the work of late Professor Bala Subramaniam, who's no more, who's at IIT Kanpur, who did a lot of work on several other aspects of the uh, iron pillar, which I don't have time to touch upon all of that. But uh, briefly speaking, of course, uh, the iron pillar has a Gupta Brahmi inscription on it, which informs us that it's a victory monument of Vikramaditya, uh, Chandragupta Vikramaditya II, uh, of around 400 CE. And there is a plaque there which translates uh, as the king who, having the name of Chandra, carried a beauty of countenance of the full moon. The lofty standard of the divine Vishnu was set up on the hill of Vishnu Pada. And Bala Subramaniam and some other scholars have also proposed that uh, the Vishnu Pada refers to Vishnu Pada Giri, which is the top of the Udayagiri mountain. Uh, which has the famous Gupta era cave shrines such as Varaha. And uh, it has been speculated that this pillar was originally erected on this hill and then moved from that location to its current uh, location in the Kutub Minar complex. And you do see these uh, depictions also in Gupta coins of these kind of standards, which uh, kind of staffs, which uh, do to some extent remind you of uh, something like you know, well, not quite, uh, but anyway, it does have some bearing perhaps in the uh, understanding the significance of the pillar and such like. And uh, of course, phosphoric iron uh, has also been found in terms of tradition, uh, in terms of modern science and all that to show uh, superior corrosion resistance when compared to commercially available steels. And this was also research that had been uh, carried out by Professor Bala Subramaniam and others, which uh, he had also shared uh, with me at the time, uh, where they had uh, attempted to map the corrosion resistance of different types of uh, phosphoric ions and some with a similar composition of the Delhi iron pillar and found that to be having very good corrosion resistance. Anyway, I won't go into this topic uh, too much because uh, uh, I'll now move on to uh, some other aspects of iron and steel metallurgy. And uh, so now you're looking at the iron carbon phase diagram. I think uh, some of you may already be familiar with phase diagrams. Uh, they essentially map the composition uh, when you have an alloy added to a major element and uh, you know, sh tries to show you what happens when you keep adding increasing amounts of that element to the alloy, what happens at different temperatures and what kind of phases form and things like that. And you know, there are, it's, it's just incredible how, you know, with modern metallurgy, uh, the behavior of different alloys uh, has been mapped in, in, in such great detail. And there have also been, you know, these were empirically undertaken experiments where, uh, you know, at different control situations, uh, it was, yeah, they were attempted to alloy different constituents to um, each other to see what sort of structure forms. And then there's a whole uh, set of the handbook of metallurgical structures, which has been extensively published. So basically, you just need to, if you want to, for instance, try to get uh, a certain kind of alloy, you just have to try it in, in, in the laboratory. And then you look at the metallurgical structure and you can compare it with the published structures. And it gives you an idea of the composition even without you know undertaking an analysis and things like that so it's very useful that way to understand the phase diagrams and if you look at the iron carbon uh, phase diagram system now i talked about wrought iron of course in the context of the delhi iron pillar and wrought iron typically has a carbon content uh, which is below about 0.04 percent carbon so we are actually referring to a rather low carbon alloy when we talk about wrought iron but as we keep adding uh, more and more carbon to the iron, uh, the properties changed. And perlitic higher carbon steel, for instance, has a composition of about 0.8% carbon. And so that is also, in today's terms, that is seen as a medium carbon or high carbon steel, actually, because uh, so as you keep adding carbon, of course, iron gets uh, harder and uh, you know, it gets, improves the properties of ductility and so on. And uh, Woods is interestingly a particular kind of alloy, which is an ultra high carbon steel. 
which forms in a composition range of about 1% to 2% carbon. And so that's uh, the topic that I'm going to now talk about a bit more. And cast iron has about 4% carbon. Now, cast iron, of course, is a brittle material, and it's not actually very workable. But uh, somehow it was a Chinese, and it's also a difficult technology for smelting. You need to have a blast furnace and so on. But the Chinese mastered the technology of cast iron very early on, and already by the early Christian era, cast iron was being used extensively in China in the Han period and so on. And uh, the other region in Asia which, which seemed to have developed an early mastery of using higher carbon alloys was the Indian subcontinent, where uh, the use of woods is known to have been prevalent. And as I said, it's described as an ultra high carbon steel with between one to two percent um, carbon. And you're looking um, in, in, in the above picture at a typical ingot of the wood steel. This is from the Telangana region, uh, uh, which is also uh, through our collaborator in the region, Dr. Jai Kishan. And you can see it also with a fragment of a crucible. Now, India has been reputed for its iron and steel with some of the earliest finds of the uh, of ultra high carbon steels in the world. And I'll touch upon these. Some of these seem to come from the early Christian era at least, or uh, maybe the late first millennium BCE from uh, parts of Southern India. But of course, I don't, won't go too much into the antiquity, but more to talk about how to recognize uh, this kind of steel and so on. And Woods is uh, said to be derived from the anglicized version of the term Ukku in the languages uh, from the states of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and Andhra Pradesh, which denotes steel. And the European travelers observed the making of steel by these crucible refining processes. And uh, they've described that in uh, quite detail as Woods, crucible steel, and so on. And they also reported the export of this wood steel from various ports in southern India to Persia and West Asia and so on. And for example, one of the travelers, Francis Buchanan, who traveled in the Mysore region just after the fall of Tipu Sultan, observed the, you know, these, he made these rather useful little sketches. And he also described the carburization of iron by packing it with leaves and uh, uh, stems and carbonation materials and so on. So Buchanan's document is quite interesting in that sense to get an understanding of the processes which were in, in vogue then. And for example, uh, above, what you do see once the smelt is over is the tuyer, which is a kind of blow pipe through which the draft would have been uh, let into the furnace using the back bellows. And quite often it's the tuyers and the slags and the crucibles which are really what are left at the site and really you really see too much of the furnace and other remains. And uh, you also see here a conjectural sketch of the Woods furnace, which is inspired by Buchanan sketches and uh, typically using these bag bellows. And what the Woods process really entailed was that wrought iron was placed in these little crucibles and fired at these high, uh, firing temperatures under very highly reducing temperatures so that the iron got carburized uh, and the, uh, the, the carbon got into the iron to give this composition of high carbon steel. And what was also remarkable about the Woods process is in earlier times, for instance, in uh, Europe and so on, there was the process of carburizing iron uh, using the solid state cementation process. But in that, it was mainly a solid state process and you know, too much of the carbon didn't actually get into the steels. So those were more medium carbon steels or low carbon steels typically. But it was because these, uh, this process of carburizing wrought iron in crucibles under very high firing cycles was mastered that they were able to achieve this high carbon content, which then uh, yielded these ingots which had uh, very unique properties that I'll come to, but before that I'll just explain uh, what we mean by this process of carburization to uh, high carbon steel. So basically you're looking at some fragments of crucibles which I came across in a site in Tamil Nadu called Mail Sirvalu, which uh, has typically you can see how the ingot would have been uh, enveloped in these crucibles and they were all this all this carbonaceous matter packed into it. And you, know, you can see also that the crucible has got very highly vitrified and there are some iron remnants as well. 
And when you make a cross section or metallurgical section of the crucible, because it's very vitrified, you can actually make a section just like a metallurgical section. And then you see that it has these globules or you know prills as you call them. And the globule is also quite perfectly spherical as you can see. So what that indicates is actually that it has got carburized to really the molten state. And this molten carburization happens um, only if in this case, the temperature would have had to be quite high. And also it would have had to have very highly reducing conditions in the furnace of about uh, you know, at least uh, 1200, if not 1300 degrees centigrade. And so, and it's through this molten carburization that you find this formation of the prior austenite grain, which is actually hexagonal. And inside that hexagonal austenite grain, as it cools, you get the formation of the perlite. I'm talking about this in some detail because it has some relevance uh, as we go along and, you know, to the products of this boot steel. So you see in the, mid in the middle of this uh, hexagonal prior austenite grain, the formation of this lamellar, you know, network of perlite. And around it, you have this network of lightly etched cementite. And so in this case, when you etch it, the perlite etches dark and the cementite is, remains unetched. And so this is keep this pattern in mind as we go along. And you also find that the, the, the glassy matrix of the crucible also has a lot of uh, trapped, uh, well, of course, quartz particles and so on. But in this case, it also has these coked rice hull relics where the rice hull has got uh, fired and you know, it's also very silicious. So it adds to the silicious matrix. And so the addition of rice hull relics also contributed to improving the refractory properties of the crucible. So, you know, this quartz rich uh, um, matrix as well of the glassy matrix that managed to ensure that very high temperatures could be withstood and uh, that very high fire, long and high firing cycles could be maintained. So some of these, uh, you know, aspects are quite important to understanding how the steel was made. And uh, now, we're also looking here at some crucibles and two-year fragments from a furnace in Kodumanal, which is a megalithic site in Tamil Nadu, which was dated to about 3rd century BCE. And you can see here that, uh, so I'd undertaken a cross-section of this crucible, and you can see uh, the uh, uh, electron probe microanalysis dot map at the bottom, which uh, indicates, again, that the Iron-rich constituents have, you know, segregated, and it's mainly a crucible matrix from ferrous processing of, um, uh, of you know, it's related to some ferrous processing process. So you could say it is some kind of maybe precursor, if not quite uh, a wood steel, but certainly was used in some kind of processing using crucibles, which could have been related to uh, what we know leads up to the woods process, and. What you're looking at above is a nail from Patanam, which is an early historic site in Kerala, which uh, I had investigated and that was sampled courtesy of uh, the um, KCHR in Cherian. And you can see there this typical hyper eutectoid structure, which you also saw in the male cerebellar crucible, where you have this network of perlite surrounded by prior austenite and surrounded by cementite grains. And so that's even without doing the analysis, you can tell straight away that that is the typical structure of hyper eutectoid steel. So it was already being certainly manufactured by this process uh, by the early Christian era. And it's also interesting that there are some of these accounts, such as the Roman accounts of iron from the Ceres, uh, Pliny the Elder's accounts and so on, which some have speculated it might, that it might refer to the Chera kingdom of this domain, but there are others who may not agree and so on. And Kodumanal is also a site which is mentioned in Tamil Sangam sites as Kodumanan and so on. And as I was saying, the dot matrix, again, you can see how the, the whitish parts, uh, you know, are where the iron has concentrated and uh, the other colors relate to the slag remnants and things like that. Now, why that uh, particular microstructure is significant also is because the woods was also famous for making these Damascus blades. Um, and these fabled Damascus blades were also well known for these patterns that they had. And that pattern typically comes from the forging and the etching of the woods ingot, 
where you have these alternating wavy patterns of dark perlite and light cementite and you know this very wavy uh, pattern which was described as Damask in Arabic and so on. And in fact, the account of Tavernier in 1697 suggests that uh, tens of thousands of these ingots were being traded from uh, Hyderabad or Golconda regions to Persia. And he kept insisting that this is the only kind of steel which could be damashed, which could get these kinds of patterns. So this was clearly obviously because they were able to get the true uh, wood steel in, in some of these uh, uh, regions here in uh, Golconda and so on. And this was apparently a very widespread activity, you know, which was almost like a pre semi-industrial um, uh, enterprise there. And you're looking above at uh, the sword of Tipu Sultan, which is the National Museum, and several of them are also found to be Damascus blades, apart, of course, from Mughal and Rajput blades and so on. Of course, that's a vast topic in itself. And some of the blacksmiths in the northern Telangana, they still have memories of forging wood steel, but many of them are now forgetting how to forge it as well. Uh, and uh, so this is one of the last black, uh, blacksmiths who is now no more. Um, and uh, so we were also trying to record some of these fading memories and such like. And there, of course, I don't want to go into that, but there are also these techniques of forging and so on, because this was not, uh, you know, the wood blades could not be forged at red heat, but they had to be forged uh, at, at, you know, at a certain uh, lower temperatures, because otherwise at red heat, they would become brittle and so on. So there are many facets to all of this, which have to be documented. And just to give an indication of the kinds of analysis that uh, one can use, um, one of the interesting aspects, now these were some of the surveys that we did of crucible steel uh, sites in the Telangana region. This was a collaborative study that I had undertaken with uh, Dr. Jai Kishan and Dr. Jill Joliffe and Professor Ranganathan, and we had surveyed uh, and documented a lot of sites in the region of Telangana, including Kona Samutram and so on. And typically these crucibles are made with two layers. There is the inner layer, which is very carbon rich and carbonaceous. And then the outer layer is packed with a lot of quartz and refractory materials and so on. So that uh, you can see that, for example, in this CT scan image, uh, the separation of the two layers, uh, there is a lining and the luting and so on. And the outer layer is very silicious. And I think I didn't put in that dot map, but we also found that the outer layer actually was also quite rich in, uh, in zircon, the element zircon. So they seem to have packed it with a lot of sands which contain zircon and things like that. And zircon actually, it's a useful material to have as a refractory because it tends to improve the refractory quality. And even today it's used in modern refractory materials and so on. So this is just to give an indicate that there's quite a lot that one can study, um, you know, in terms of, uh, and there is still a lot more work to be done in terms of the production mechanisms and so on. I really don't know how I'm doing for time, but anyway, oh, it's six o'clock, right? I think another, I, I might go on for another 10 minutes or so. Um, well, uh, so I was talking about the swords of Tipu Sultan, and here this is uh, one of these, which has a very beautiful tiger motif. And here you also see the work of Koftgari, which is another kind of damascening technique, where damascening really refers to the use of patterns with different kinds of metals. And you see that this also has a very distinctive damask pattern. And one of the famous blacksmiths in Tipu's time was Asadullah. And here you also see that this hilt is made by the technique, which is known as Koftgari, where you have the gold wire, which is pressed into the surface of iron and burnished, and that also carries on, it still survives uh, in some parts of Rajasthan, but has declined uh, quite a bit. And you also see this painting from uh, the palace of Tipu Sultan, the Darya Daulat Bagh, where you see the Nizam of Hyderabad with a Samshir, Samshir, so I just thought I would put that in for, um, well, another very important dimension of the wood story is that, um, it in a way inspired this transfer of technology from East to West. And British, French, and Russian metallography was greatly spurred due to the quest to document the structure of wood steel. And key figures such as Michael Faraday also attempted to replicate wood steel. And we have uh, talked about this also in our book on India's legendary wood steel. 
and many 19th century innovations also stemmed out of these studies. For instance, Faraday's work on alloy steels, which paved the way for you know, for the Industrial Revolution. And Cyril Stan Stanley Smith also commented that because the Damascus blade had this very clear macro structure, it was also one of the very early artifacts to be studied under the, micro um, uh, under the microscope and as a metallograph and so on. And it's quite amazing that in 1821, the French scientist Briand did an astonishing 300 experiments or so to understand the composition of wood steel. And he attempted alloying with uranium and palladium and various other elements. Uh, so, you know, at great personal risk as well, because it wasn't totally clearly understood as well as to what was the element which actually contributed to hardening the steel, because of course the Damascus sword also had this reputation of cutting, of a very good cutting edge and so on. Um, and so this was why uh, it also led to eventually to people like uh, the Swedish chemist, uh, and Bergman finding out that it was actually carbon which contributed to uh, the improved properties in steel. And it's also an interesting uh, aspect as I was talking about the transfer of technology because Mouchette in 1825 recognized that the Indian process basically uh, involved the action of uh, carburetted hydrogen in converting iron to steel. And in fact, he then took out a patent and so on. So that was basically, uh, you know, the fact that it was carbon that was... Uh, uh, playing a role, which uh, was something which was then recognized and patented. So it was then the Indian process. And then also there was a lot of move towards um, crucible steel production also by Benjamin Hunts, Huntsman and so on. And uh, following that, high carbon steels also became more widely available for various purposes. Well, there is another very remarkable story uh, in which the Indian subcontinent can claim primacy, and that is of zinc metal production. And the earliest firm evidence for the production of metal, metallic zinc is from the Indian subcontinent. And in fact, zinc is one of the most difficult metals to smelt because zinc volatilizes at about the same temperature of about 1000 degrees centigrade that is needed to smelt the zinc ore because it tends to sublimate which is that as soon as you, as you smelt it, it turns into a vapor. And so you're not able to extract it into the metallic form. And in fact, so what was happening in the earlier periods, for example, in the Roman world is that brass was being used, but the way it was made was that they were co-smelting copper and tin ores to uh, form brass. And in that case, so you would get brass, which did not have too much of zinc. It never exceeded about 35% zinc because they were not able to uh, isolate the zinc in the metallic form. But the evidence suggests that in India, there is unique and extensive and almost semi-industrial production of metallic zinc in the area of Zavar and so on, at least by about the 12th century. And in fact, the ASM Landmark Award was also awarded in uh, 1988 for Zavar for the remains of the zinc <laughs> cementing process. And typically here at Zawar, there were numerous finds of retorts and furnaces. And the process of smelting of zinc was uh, what is known as downward distillation, where basically the, uh, so this, this furnace had two parts. Uh, what you normally were seeing was that the, the in, in the furnace is that the blast comes into the bottom. But here, the furnace was designed such that the koshti or the furnace has two parts. The top part of the furnace chamber has the retort and the bottom part has the stem which goes down so that there's a drastic difference in the temperature. And in fact, the charge is on the top and the fuel also is on the top. So it's the top part of the furnace which is fired and it is in, in, in the top part of the retort that the zinc core is, 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 is packed, the charge is packed. So that uh, what happens is that when it is smelted and forms a zinc vapor, it goes down through that condenser into the bottom part of the furnace, which is, you know, it, it, which is much cooler because of the fact that it is, uh, you know, there's a perforated uh, brick layer through which these retorts are packed. And due to this condensation process, it is, the vapor is able to be condensed and uh, into the liquid state, and then it solidifies into, you know, what look like droplets at the bottom of the furnace. So, this was quite an you know, ingenious way of, of uh, actually extracting the zinc in the metallic form. And 
So basically, you know, you had a temperature gradient of about 500 degrees so that the milk could solidify into these globules at the bottom of the furnace. And as you can see there, uh, you see the uh, perforated plate. And so there's archeological remnants could be found dating to about the 12th century. And this was work that was extensively done by the group of Paul Craddock and uh, from the British Museum and others also originally KTM Hegde and so on. And you can see there are still a numerous retorts which are in situ. And a lot of the retorts are also used as a building material often in the walls. The walls are packed with it because they tend to be, you know, vitrified and impervious and so on. So uh, they have their uses in this building material as well. And you can hear, see here these uh, details of the furnace. And it's also interesting that uh, the, uh, there's a lot of literature in terms of descriptions of the accounts of zinc smelting. The 12th century Sanskrit text of the Rasaratna Samuchaya describes this method of zinc production as Thiryak Patana. And there's also talk of the Thiryak Patana Yantra, or, you know, the apparatus for the downward distillation. And uh, there's a lot of correlation as well. For instance, a retort is described as uh, uh, being aubergine shaped and so on, which is a good description and the use of salt of sintering and so on. So a lot of studies have been made on the uh, refractory materials using thin sections and so on by Paul Craddock and uh, the team. And they've actually found a lot of good correlations with the textual references. So it's quite an interesting example of how uh, you know, there is a whole body of textual evidence as well to uh, support the development of this indigenous method of zinc smelting. And of course, the production of metallic zinc was virtually unknown in Europe until William Champion first established the commercial and industrial zinc smelting operations in Bristol in the 1740s. And it seems that it was actually inspired by the Zauer process. So there's a, a very good correlation there, though, of course, again, this is one of those examples of transfer of technologies with uh, not so much of acknowledgement in such life. And of course, I also put in this other slide because, uh, of course, I've had a training in Bharatanatyam and I couldn't help thinking of the fact that, you know, the, the concept of rasa and the Nat Natya Shastra, it does have this connotation of the distilled essence and, you know, reaching this this aesthetic refinement, which is almost like a distillation process. And I couldn't help wondering whether there is an analogy because this term rasa is used so often. Of course, there are other terms to describe zinc, like yasada and so on, but the fact that, and rasa could also refer to mercury, but this whole idea of distillation seems to have been also one which perhaps had a certain kind of alchemical significance. And you also see it coming up in, in giant treatises and so on, apart from the uh, uh, iatrochemical texts like the Rasaratna Samuchen and such like. And uh, of course, we do also have the use of innovative alloys of zinc in uh, the Indian subcontinent, notably the Bidri ware, which is a very ex exquisite metal craft that originated in the Bidar region in Karnataka in the 14th century under the rule of the Muslim Bahmani sultans, which is inspired by the elegance of the Persian decorative techniques. And uh, here you're seeing this photograph is actually from the Bidar Fort. And uh, speaking of iron, there are these massive uh, wrought iron cannon as well, which are really quite uh, impressive in terms of the, the feat of forging. And they would have been made by assembling these rings of uh, forged wrought iron and so on. So it's really quite extraordinary. And of course, the term Bidri were also uh, refers to the township of Bidar, which was the chief center for manufacturing wear and uh, used to make uh, geometrical and floral inlaid metal work. And uh, so here you're looking at one of the artisans. As you can see, of course, the Bidri uh, the, the high, is, is basically a high zinc alloy where you have about uh, an alloy of more than 90% zinc and you know, a small amount of copper, which is then damascened or inlaid. And at the bottom here, you're looking at, so you can see that the zinc is actually quite a dull looking metal. And it's, it's then inlaid with silk and with, it's, it's in, inlaid with silver. And then it's uh, packed with certain etchings and ammonia salts and so on. And then you get this very beautiful black patination. 
And of course, amongst the techniques that we often use to analyze artifacts, uh, one of the useful ones is uh, XRF. And XRF works for, you know, artifacts like this, which may not have, uh, uh, you know, corroded too much. It's not that helpful when we come to copper artifacts or iron and so on, which can have a lot of corrosion over a, a long period of time. But uh, some of these kinds of artifacts, like more recent vintiware, which hasn't corroded too much, is quite useful. And here, uh, this was some analysis that we had made, which, which shows that it was 90% uh, zinc uh, alloy with about 6% copper. Um, yeah, so, well, so just to point out that the Indian subcontinent was home to several skills in terms of traditional mining and metallurgy and metal processing. And many of these artisans are increasingly facing marginalization in an era of industrialization and globalization. And some of this insights into material char characterization is also useful to explore aspects of scientific con conservation and uh, preservation. Well, I won't actually touch upon the medieval bronze st statuary today, which I was going to talk about tomorrow. But I will mention, if I, if I still have time, I would like to share the... Uh, video of the lost wax bell casting uh, and I will discuss it later but <laughs> just to point out that of course there's a great tradition of using uh, the lost wax method in the Indian subcontinent and uh, typically these icons the Chola icons or the Chola style icons which they continue to make in places in the Tanjavur district is made by the lost wax process but where uh, first the wax model of the image to be cast is made and then it is covered with numerous layers of clay and the wax is melted out and the metal to be cast is poured in. And this technique has also been used to make these bells. Well, I'll discuss it a little more later, but I thought I'd just take you through the steps where first uh, the bell making mold is made, uh, the, the base, the, the clay base, and then the wax model is put on top of it and shaped by a hand lathe and then again it's covered to form the mold. And so you see some of these processes. Uh, this master craftsman is no more and to some extent in Tanjavur and so on, they've switched over to the sand casting process to, to a great degree. So it's quite valuable to still preserve this bell making process, uh, or at least to have some record of it, so to speak. So it, it is rather sad that just last year we learned that he is no more. Um, so how do I...
Yes. Scrap of rice mixed with uh, alluvial clay, and then he makes the rope wet. Um, okay. He makes the rope wet, and then he puts this around the rope. As I said, the purpose of putting the rope is so that it will uh, make the mud detachable. Mr. Govind Rajan is 62 years old. The apple and the paninga, younger cousin. He learned all this from his father, who was a traditional bell maker. Our Kamala, ra, unga pa. Oh, you know he is the last. This is I see. In this whole area, he is the last surviving person making, knowing this process of doing it in this traditional way. So it's really important we document him. My cell phone. Can I go already? Go already. So he uses that to mark out the dimensions. Um, now, Mr. Govind Rajan is heating this uh, mold so that it dries quickly. Pale galu se pinya panu matanga na panu angla. In the old days, of course, they would leave it to dry in the sunshine, but now they are doing this. To speed up the process using a blower, and, and according to Mr. Govind Rajan, he is all, not so keen to take up this profession because he says there's there's not much, you know, prospects of income and all that, which would be very sad because they are the last some of the last few craftsmen who are practicing these traditional techniques. So oh, Mr. Mariaman is mixing the grade of clay which is going to be used next on top of the um, mold that's being prepared now for the bell. That benefit, he's showing us uh, the pieces of the wax model and how it looks. So as you can see, the, the, at the rim, the thickness is around one inch, a little more than an inch actually, inch and a half. And over here, it's uh, less than an inch. It's about one centimeter. And this, this, this piece goes on top. Mix it with this, uh, it's called Kugelium powder of kugelium and this is beeswax and that is melted together and uh, heated and melted down and both of that is approximately the same percentage. He's just using, basically he just uses his thumb to like a spatula to shape it. So what he's explaining is that the process that he just showed us after um, a sort of rough mold like that is made, it will look like this. And after it has dried, he's going to show us what he'll do next to it, which is basically the application of the wax layer. And are the yellow nai nai where 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 thing would dry in for the It it takes one uh, it takes one day to dry. Yeah. Now, Mr. Govind Rajan is going to put on the next grade of clay. First, the core was made. As we saw, it had been dried and it was shaped. And now the final grade of, grade of clay has been put. And it is against this final grade that the wax model will be put. This is... Uh, fiber from sack. So this fiber has also been mixed in the clay to give it good binding properties. Oh, you know, father. Huh? Small father. <laughs> If you 
can see the, the line here where it's not joining. So he basically showed with the charcoal by drawing that line that it should really be finished so well that those it gets a proper circle around it. So that was what he was trying to explain. It is a circle. Okay. Now he uses a piece of charcoal uh, to see whether it is forming perfect sort of uh, spheres when he turns it. And he draws a line to see if it's a clean line. And now finally we come to the process of putting the wax onto the model and that's exactly what he's going to do now. Uh, so this is done so that he can gauge the thickness of the wax. I.e. he will build up the, the layer up to the thickness of this wax, right? Yeah. And now he's sort of kneading it like a chapati, the Indian uh, dough. So it's almost like he makes it like the shape of a chapati. Chapati, I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and, okay. and he tells me that he's doing it like this with a heated spatula so that the, the mud can soak in that wax and take it in. Because first it has to get into the, 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 the wax completely, the mud completely. So we've been watching Mr. Govind Rajan at work here now for the past, I think, half an hour. And I am just stunned at how amazingly skilled he is, the mastery over every uh, stage of this and the way he manages to get this really silky smooth finish. And as the, the owner was telling me, what's also really crucial, which he's a real master of, is the way he shapes the bell, because that shape, a beautiful, elegant shape, it's very crucial to the kind of quality of sound and the resonance. So it's all there in his head, how he gets the, the shape that produces a really good sound. I take one of the full view also. Full view of the map is clear. This is a map clear. A book of the action of the Pandra Madhya. What uh, Mr. Govindraj has just told me is that the bell he is making is for a Hindu temple. For the Hindu temple, they put this flange around the bell. Rip. They put a rip for a Hindu temple. Oh, I see. He says only if they put this visceri, it becomes a Hindu temple bell. Yeah. And if it's not put, then it's more like a church bell. Hmm? Now, the reason as to why he puts the flange, it, it causes the Om sound, you know, the Om sound, which is very important to Hindu prayer. So apparently, only when he has the flange, then 
there's a deeper own sound comes to sense. That's the rationale. So that's the most elegant and beautiful wax body shape. So, and I want to introduce all our other friends here. This is Mr. Govindrajan, and that is his son, Mr. Who I hope he will be inspired now to take this draft. Ningalo if we the fun mango and it has and we would also like to thank very much uh, uh, Mr. Anand then of course who runs this workshop and he has kept this draft alive. Vanga Vanga. And this is Mr. Ari Varanam and all his other uh, team of people helping out here. Ari Varanam. And uh, in the FTG garden thing, you know, uh, craft me and you know, 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 you observe this fascinating process of making from scratch the model, the wax model for a bell for a Hindu temple. And now it's about five o'clock here in Nachar Koil, almost sundown and time to go. And uh, we've had a very successful and very exciting day. We've watched this model being built up from scratch and he has shown us all the different grades of clay that we use to make the base. Uh, base patterns and the base molds on top of which the wax model has been made and very excitingly we've seen how it's been finished to such perfection this beautiful shape and the shape is really what gives the beautiful quality the resonant properties of the bell well we may or may not be able to actually watch the casting because it, we, we are facing rather inclement weather now but uh, uh, even so we, we've managed to see the most of this very exciting process which is in a way a dying tradition because there are not so many people who are following these very traditional methods anymore. Thank you. I think that was a very fascinating video. So, thank you. Is that, that's the end of the presentation? Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't yeah. know if I'm doing for time, but... Uh, there are a few questions, if we can very quickly take them up. If it's yeah, sure. okay with you, I'll just uh, quickly take them up. Um, the first question is, uh, when was the earliest gold extraction or use as ornament, gold as for ornaments, coins, currency, uh, started in India? If you could tell, when was gold first used in India? Yeah, well, um, with the first use of gold in the world, you see in Bulgaria, which is actually um, going back uh, some 5,000 years, really, 5,000 BC, they say, in Varna. But as far as India is concerned, well, Mohenjo-daro and uh, Harappa, you clearly have, this is about already 3,000 to 2,500 BC, quite a lot of extensive use of gold, as I was, I was saying, the gold headbands, and there are the repousse, fish motifs and very tiny, tiny gold beads. I mean, those are extraordinary. I, I didn't put in pictures because I didn't know how much one could cover. But, uh, um, you know, for instance, in the Holavira, you have these really, really tiny, you know, no more than about even a, a millimeter or two faceted gold beads really work with extraordinary perfection and uh, skill, you know, in miniature. So there's a lot of skill there, of course, working. And of course, the coinage um, uh, comes in, you know, a bit uh, later. It comes in with, I guess, uh, the more of that Bactrian and Hellenistic influence and so on. And uh, certainly now, for instance, in the votive stupas, uh, you know, not just in, in, you know, the Kushan regions, but also in the Shatavahana 
regions and so on by the Christian era, you also find the use of these little uh, floral motifs, gold uh, floral motifs, which are in inside these little votive supas and crystal supas and such like. And of course, the coinage uh, then comes very much into vogue, certainly by the Gupta period and so on. So it's quite a vast topic, I guess. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, refer as far as ornaments are concerned, actually the Nilgiri hoards that you see is quite one of the quite early extant gold artifacts, which is dated to about uh, mid fifth millennium BC at least. Um, and of course, then you do also see you know, in Taxila and the Shatavahana finds also of, of gold and so on. But don't forget that one problem was that gold has always been hoarded and remelted over centuries and generations in India. So, I, I mean, I guess the sculptures and all that stand testimony to, you know, a very major legacy in gold, but perhaps because they've been passed on mainly as heirlooms. And then even within families, this beautiful, uh, you know, gold ornament is split up within yeah. various members and so that it's that whole uh, some of it has that heritage has also probably been lost, which is also why we need to actually catalog those. And also the gold, uh, which was part of the temple collections, is another very major uh, aspect and area where I'm sure there will be a lot of work to be done yeah. to study that. Thank you. The next question is um, how any reference to rustless cannons, and if yes, and how were they made? Rustless cannon. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, to, to some extent, um, by the time the cannons start becoming coming into vogue, the cast iron technology has also come into vogue a bit in Europe and so on. So quite a lot of the cannon are actually made of cast iron because, you know, to get that shape, that spherical shape is, is not that easy if you're just, you know, forge armoring. So that time, uh, so they are quite, quite a few of them are, are of cast iron. Now, what was your other question? You said, uh, were they rustless? Uh, any rustless uh, cannons. Any rustless? Oh, yeah. you're talking about the cannon or the cannonball? Yeah, the cannonball were of cast iron. You're talking about the cannon, sorry. I the question it. says how the cannons were made rustless. How are the cannon made rustless? rustless. Oh, fine. Yeah, the cannonballs, a lot of them are of cast iron. So you're talking about yeah, the, how are the cannon made um, rustless? Well, a lot of them are also of this... Uh, very high grade wrought iron. And this tradition of using high grade wrought iron seems to have been um, quite, uh, sorry, I removed my, can you hear me properly? Because yes, I removed you well. we can hear you very well. Oh, I see, okay, so maybe I didn't need the headphones after all. So um, yeah, so this tradition of using uh, wrought iron cannon also goes back to this, uh, you know, uh, mastery of using high grade wrought iron because Apart from the Delhi iron pillar, you also see the use of, you know, the wrought iron in beams in the Konara temple and so on, where it's used as structural elements, uh, you know, to support the lintels of wrought iron and so on, because wrought iron has this good tensile strength. So that tradition of using high grade wrought iron seems to have uh, been carried over. And so even in, the, in, in terms of the canon, um, a lot of analyses haven't been done, but the, uh, the, the guess is that they're again high grade phosphoric iron and which is why they've been able to withstand the rusting. And again, the, the forging to that very good finish where the slag gets redistributed very effectively would be the same kind of technology is, is what was believed. Thank you. The next question is from which region in the world can we get the first evidence of metal use? The first evidence of metal use? Hmm, the world. Yeah, so they're seeing that uh, as far as gold is concerned, the very early evidence comes from Bulgaria and this Varna. You have these extensive uh, graves uh, where there's a lot of gold, uh, we say about 5000 BC even. And of course, the Anatolian region uh, is, you know, with uh, the Levant, that's another very early area of uh, region for the development of metallurgy and, uh, you know, the early use of, um, um, of, uh, copper and such like comes and, and early smelting also they say it, it goes back to the Levant uh, maybe about uh, uh, certainly by you know around something around maybe uh, 6000 BC or so on you know the use of native copper and that kind of thing and also you have quite early evidence again from the Mehergarh region the Neolithic uh, you know Mehergarh for the use of, of copper and then bronze comes in of course the Harappan Needed around 3,000 or so BC, but 
climb in Mesopotamia as well, there's a very spectacular tradition of using bronzes. But there they're using arsenical bronzes and so on. And then, uh, you know, when you come to Egypt, you see also, also seeing very uh, intricate castings, the, the cast, uh, you know, the cat, the bust, the bust, uh, the cat figurine and so on. So very skilled lost track process and all that. So to some extent, uh, you know, the Mesopotamian and Egyptian material culture is of a different level of sophistication, really. And then al also in China, by about, uh, uh, you know, 1500 or 2000, uh, 1500 BC, certainly, you know, in Anyang, you have these enormous, really enormous, uh, you know, vessels being made. Uh, of course, this is a slightly different casting process. It's not last wax. It's a piece molding process, but they're really quite huge. I mean, huge cauldrons and things like that. So that also comes into focus. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll be talking more on bronze and so on in the next few days. Yeah. What is the exact composition of iron pillar in Delhi or, and, or are there any other examples of such pillars in India? Yeah, I, I did already actually discuss the composition. I said it was about uh, uh, carbon of about, uh, what was it, 0.2 or so percent, 0.2 to 0.3% carbon, silicon of about 0 0.05 and phosphorus of about 0.15 or so percent. And that phosphoric content was significant to give a rust-free uh, composition. Well, I think the dhar iron pillar also has a, a similar composition. There was an early analysis. But, I mean, to some extent, we all need more access to artifacts. Yeah. That's one major That's problem we always face, you know, the, the fact is that we would like to do more analyses, but getting uh, artifacts to analyze is always a challenge because, yes. you know, there are restrictions mm -hmm. and you don't need, want the artifact to get spoiled in itself. So... I think there's a long way though for the discipline of archaeometallurgy to go as well. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is, we have one, this, we have some Satwana period copper bronze artifacts and XRF analysis has been done. Is there any way in which we can tell definitely if the metal used is from India or do we have to rely on comparative analysis of earlier known studies? That's a very vast uh, topic because you said metal analysis, or you said copper bronze, right? Yeah. Now, uh, it, it depends on exactly uh, what the material is because tomorrow I'll be talking a bit about the lead isotope analysis technique. Mm -hmm. And so that has actually been used to some extent on some Shatavahana material. But I think you're preempting me because then I won't have anything to talk about in the next few talks. Yeah, yeah. No, I think yeah, we can wait for that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so there, there were some lead isotope analysis done on the, some of the Shatavana silver coins, which had a bit of lead added in them. And as, as I'll point out tomorrow, some of that is supposed, is found to come from Agni Gundala, and some of it is actually found to come from um, one of the Roman uh, mines for silver. So there was some influence from the trade and so on. So it is, I think, interesting. But I think you need to do... So you were saying comparative, yes, you need to do actually very systematic, you can't just, you know, it, it can't be just a random one-off sample, you need to do, a, a, you know, a whole batch of material and they need to be all analyzed by standardized, material, you know, methods and so on. So it's not that easy, let's say, to do this or art artifact correlation, it does need um, a more say, sustained and systematic studies and such like that. Thank you. The next question is Chenimalai Karur, supposed to have dealt with iron from Roman times. Uh, the trade links with Rome, if you could just provide some more information on that. Chenimalai Karur sites and their uh, trade links with Rome vis a vis iron. That's the question. Yeah, well, I think I did talk about the, the Roman accounts and, you know, the fact that. Uh, of course, Karur is also a local capital of the Sangam chieftains, and you have, um, you know, apart from the account of uh, Pliny about, you know, iron from Ceres, which we assume is that uh, sort of area, you also have the observation of uh, Zosimus about the, the crucible, uh, you know, making uh, ferrous metal in crucibles and so on. Um, and but I mean, to, to, and of course, even the fact that, you know, the um, that iron nail, which I reported from Patlingnam, that was again a wood steel. So it could have been some of the kinds of materials that were being exported. But 
the, the, the point is that I think all of this needs a lot more systematic study, you know, whether it's Jenny Malay or Salem and so on, you need to really do a lot more of or artifact analysis and so on. So some of these can be pointers, but I think it's, it's um, safe to say that we, you know, so definitely there was that aspect of, you know, the impetus from the trade from the Mediterranean world and so on. So, uh, but I think there's a lot, of work to be done there, let's put it like that. And one should always be, I think, a little cautious in the way one interprets the data because mm. we need to follow certain uh, academic rigors, you know. And I think, yeah. I think this urge to always say which is the earliest, which is the best, and which is this, and which is that, you know, wherever it is, I think that in a way takes away from the academic rigor of actually studying that artifact and reporting what it is, as it is, and the context of it. And that is really what we should be focusing on, you know, not getting this yeah. kind of you know, um, because that itself takes a lot of doing, so to speak. You know? This question is, are there any communities still producing wood steel by traditional methods in Telangana region or elsewhere? Well, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be that um, there's any uh, living tradition of it, because uh, for one thing, um, you know, already by the end of the colonial period, there was a market decline because uh, thanks to the Reserve Forest Act, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, smelting activities in the forest areas and all that stopped because in fact, in the Telangana, black, they were blacksmiths and they were also iron smelters. So they, they couldn't actually do that um, once there was a reserve forest came into place. And many of the smelting sites are in there in, in the, you know, that Adilabad region and so on where there are forests. Um, and along the Godavari. So uh, it, it already died out, uh, you know, uh, to, towards the end of the colonial period. And uh, yeah, and then the move over to industrial steel making. So as far as the, the, the woods, though, of course, I mean, even, uh, you know, there was actually a, quite a lot of iron smelting even in South India. We do know that now it survives mainly with the Agarias and all, but there are memories that some of the communities do have of, you know, uh, iron smelting in the cup. The Kamaris in uh, Telangana do remember the woods making, you know, they can describe the process and how they were building those woods furnaces and the crucibles and so on. They still, but most of those elderly blacksmiths are also now dying away. So we try to document some of the oral memories. But uh, yeah, that's, we have to try and act fast with all of this because it is vanishing very quickly. So there, yeah. Thank you. The next question is... Um, and wow, this seems to be like... <laughs> More questions than the talk itself. Yeah, okay, fine. Right. Next question is whether you feel there's a Near East influence in the earliest bronze or iron metallurgy of prehistoric India, possible localization of metallurgical technology, or do you think India developed its own distinct bronze or ferrous metallurgical tradition? Yeah, I think it's a bit sweeping to come to any conclusions one way or another. We have to kind of look at uh, each context in its own right because it's a very large landmass you're talking about. So, uh, you know, um, it's, it's whether you're talking about a particular assemblage in a particular context. So if you're talking about the, 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 the uh, were you talking about the Harappan material, for instance, well, as far as bronze and the lost wax process is concerned, though, of course, the Harappan, you know, that little Mohenjo-daro figurine is a very early lost wax figurine, but lost wax does seem to have also come into the Levant, you know, in, in quite well developed just a little before. So but I think this is a the larger, you know, discussion in archaeology about whether things were diffused or whether it, you know, arrives with, you know, with local in impetus. But what one can say is, of course, many things do get, uh, figured out or discovered in different cultural contexts as well. So I don't think we need to take this very rigorously, this diffusionist kind of idea, which is a bit old fashioned now, because you do need to understand the local circumstances which gave rise to certain very distinctive, you know, characteristics and whether also how the resources influence that and things. Because the one thing that the Harappan seems to have been so good at is really working in miniature. I mean, how did that, I mean, they must have been really short-sighted because everything they made was so tiny and so perfect and flawless. Whereas, you know, in China, they were making these huge cauldrons, maybe because more lead was available there. And so they didn't have that much lead in the Harappan context to make very big castings. So things were on this 
very minute scale or even just the way the bead making was so minute so the gold working is also very minute so there are all these local factors i think these are very sweeping and large questions but certainly very interesting I thank you another interesting question at zawar the lead zinc silver was found so the why the mines exploited for zinc and silver being the byproduct of the smelting so what was the question zinc were the mines exploited basically for silver so that silver for zinc so that silver then became the byproduct of the smelting because it's a zinc silver mines at zawar yeah so actually the, the silver mining was going on more in the dariba region where they have the lead silver mines because that was much more uh, 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 associated with uh, the lead zinc uh, you know process <clears throat> dariba which is also in rajasthan but slightly different from uh, zawar and there's some you know very good evidence there for for uh, you know sustained um, silver extra extraction and lead smelting in zawar it is actually this fallerite ore which is being uh, which is being used and so that doesn't actually overlap that much with the silver mining process though they were probably prospecting for silver and this and that and trying out different minerals and materials and so that's why i think one would have you know influenced uh, the outcome of the other and such like uh, but the correlation between silver and lead smelting is much more Thank you. The next question, I think you did point. It says, has it been practically possible Sorry? to carry out metallurgical studies on samples taken from museum collections for you, like swords, shields, cannons, etc., to understand our original technology, or has that been largely unexplored? Yeah, could you repeat that question, please? The question is, were you possible? Uh, was it possible for you to carry out metallurgy? metallography studies on samples taken from museum collections which includes sports shields etc to understand the original technology or has that been largely unexplored I mean, how easy has it been for you to carry out studies on museum collections i think that is the question yeah so it's well i won't say that it's um, you know because of course many museums are concerned about not damaging artifacts and things like mm -hmm. that so there is uh, and of course, the practices I've been using are what are followed in standard conservation practice and museum practice internationally. So, but even so, I think that it, it is a process of establishing a rapport and, you know, getting a particular collection to get interested. And it, it almost seems that maybe even when I was beginning in archaeology, there was a much more interest in, you know, archaeometallurgy in a very processual sort of way mm -hmm. but I, I don't know whether over time you know collections have become even more cautious and things because you know um mm -hmm. but but of course we are trained in minimal destruction and you know for instance some of the microstructures that um are done is really really looking you know less than a millimeter very very you know like mm -hmm. a tiny shaving or a, a filing tomorrow when i talk about lead acid analysis that was also done on very very fine drilling so if you have that but the problem is also you need to have very sophisticated techniques to be able to do analysis of very small amounts of materials and that's not always very easy to get as well because those are expensive so it is a challenge it's not very straightforward at all by any means i mean it's um i, I hope things will improve well, one thing we could say is that the more sophisticated the technologies become the more you know easy it is to probably study artifacts with less and less invasive means and so on. But uh, it, it's, it's a challenge. It's not the easiest of subject to be in, frankly. <laughs> then I think, what am I doing? I think I need to give this all up and do something which is not such, doesn't give not such a headache really to deal with. And I might just opt out as well. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's nice to have all this interest and I hope that the next generation will carry forward and you know get engaged. I think uh, that was the last question. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, we hope to listen to you tomorrow when we talk about this. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you ma'am for the wonderful presentation and we hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you so much and it's great to have had such an engaged discussion and very interesting questions as well. So thank you for your patience and no, thank you. encouragement as well because sometimes we also need to know that there are people interested in these very arcane things, you know, otherwise um, so it's good to have that solidarity. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye everyone. See you.